Before we get started with this episode, let me point out the obvious. It's the gift-giving season. But what isn't so obvious is that you can get your gifts and help out the podcast by going to comicsalternative.com slash Amazon. Click through on our Amazon banner, and whatever you get during that visit, the Comics Alternative will get a few cents kickback. So get your Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, and Festivus gifts through our Amazon associate links. It's a smart way to shop, and you'll be helping out the show. So let's get started with this thing. Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. This is the Comics Alternative, episode 219. A review of Best American Comics 2016. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. Yes, we are. And on this, our penultimate episode of the year, Andy and I are going to be looking at the Best American Comics 2016. But before we get into that discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off cover, cover price. Sometimes 50% off. But many times, the discounts can get more impressive than that. That's right. And in this episode, we're talking about the... Uh, tw- the 2016 Best American Comics volume, and while that's not available on DCB service, many of the creators we'll be talking about today will uh, likely be available, if not now, uh, definitely in the near future. Mm-hmm. That's right. Uh, you can't go wrong with Discount Comic Book Service, so head on over to DCBService.com. They'll take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and say, Hey, the two guys with PhDs sent me. That's right. Well, Andy, before we jump into this year's volume of the Best American Comics, uh, I think you had a couple of bits of news you wanted to share. Yeah, well, um, many of our listeners may know this one already, but uh, just I think it was as we're recording this, Yesterday, so it it would be um, about a week ago on the um, when this podcast goes live, uh, the um, Kickstarter campaign for the Drew Friedman documentary, the Vermeer of the Borscht Belt, uh, was successfully funded, uh, and it just squeaked by. I think it, it got like about four hundred dollars over the fifty thousand uh, dollar goal. So. Um, I was glad for glad we were glad to see that happen since we had Drew on and maybe we did we did our own little part to make that that four hundred dollars happen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we helped to push him over the edge, uh, and and I think you did help to push him over the edge. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I I had been planning on doing it for a while. Um, uh, as when we talked to Drew, I, I had mentioned even that they had the uh, fifty dollar level. You could get a videotape of the documentary, right? When it was made VHS, and um, and that was like the Cyber Monday deal. So that that went away before I could I could get it. But that one actually did come back um, at, at the very end. And also they added a thirty dollar level where you could get a a Shemp Howard T shirt with, with a with Drew's 
drawing out of Shemp on it, and I thought, well, I got to have that. Yeah, the famous screw <laughs> image of uh, Shemp. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm glad that you were able to be a part of that. Like an idiot, I missed out. And what what I did after we interviewed Drew is I, I used a strategy that I normally do to remind myself to, to do things such as, you know, back certain Kickstarters before right. the deadline runs out, is I pulled – the uh, page, the Kickstarter page up in a browser tab, and I left it open. Right. And so over the past, I don't know, b- before it uh, ended, for about three days or so, I was monitoring that, and I had that tab up to remind me, back it in some way. Mm-hmm. And like an idiot, I hemmed and hawed and then forgot And yesterday when I came to the computer and realized what I had done when I saw the tab and that the 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 deadline had already passed, I I was pissed. Yeah. Sorry sorry about that. I'll uh you know I'll share. We can go to a con and I'll wear the shemp t shirt on the first day and you can wear it on the second day once it's got a good kind of con funk in it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That'd be, uh, you know, that, that, that would show that, uh, you know, how dedicated we are at uh, working with one another. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sorry I missed out on that. Glad you got in on it. But I'm, you know, ultimately, we're both very happy that that Kickstarter uh, was, was successfully funded because I'm sure that's going to be a great documentary. And again, Drew was a great guy to have on the show. Mm-hmm. Yes, he was. Um, then, then one of the other things I just wanted to mention is that um, to to kind of give a plug to another podcast. This is completely unsolicited, uh, but uh, one of my favorite podcasts, going back to when I first started listening to podcasts, was uh, one done by by a guy named Tom Caters, who did a series called Tom versus the flash in which he did a short about 30 minute or so episode, uh, that basically covered each issue of the, uh, the flash series, uh, starring, you know, Barry Allen. Hmm. And so that was a long, <laughs> you know, that, that was a long podcast, uh, to go through. And, uh, and then I think he did Aquaman after that, he did Tom versus Aquaman before he did, he had done Tom versus the justice league of America uh, that was before I was listening to him. And now, uh, about a year ago, he started doing Tom versus the Secret Society of Supervillains, which is, you know, a pretty short series. I think it's about 18 issues. Uh, and um, and the first episode of that came out a year ago, um, December 2015. And the second episode just came out this month. Uh, and so that's that's exciting. But what's also notable and one of the reasons why I wanted to mention this on the podcast is because I, he's do, Tom Caters is doing something really noble with this, which is that he has set up a Patreon campaign. Uh, you can find it at patreon.com slash Tom Caters, T-O-M-K-A-T-E-R-S. Uh, and it's called Tom versus Comics versus Hate. And basically, if you donate to the Patreon campaign, He's giving all of the the money generated from that to the Southern Poverty Law Center, and um, and so far this has only been up a little while. He's already at two hundred ninety dollars per month, and the goal at two hundred dollars was that he would do two podcasts a week, um, and if this hits six hundred dollars, he's going to do three podcasts a week. Wow! Uh, so that that's a lot of podcasting. Um, but um, this is a this is a really good cause. I really admire him for doing it, and so I thought uh, I would like to uh, encourage our listeners, if they're not already listening and uh, and backing this, to uh, maybe throw a couple dollars towards this good cause. That that is a great cause, and um, you know it, it it just shows that when you do something for others uh, via Patreon, that. Uh, People are going to come flocking. Yeah. Which, you know, may be a reason why his Kickstarter campaign is much more uh, successful than ours because we're we're selfish mofos. We're keeping the money for ourselves. Oh, that could be. <laughs> but I, no, that, that is a the noble cause. Now, I, I have not listened to that podcast, but you say it's uh, outside of the year hiatus. It's been around for a good while. 
Yeah, it's been around for a long time. And actually, I really, um, yeah, it's it's really funny. Tom's really good at, at, at doing what he does. Uh, and it's just basically, uh, you know, it's very short, too. So it's you get a lot of, um, you know, you, you don't need a huge investment in it. But it, it's fun to, ha- to, to listen to him uh, poke fun at some of the uh, outrageous stuff that was going on in comics in the 70s. Hmm. Well, you know, that's just another example of how creators can, um, you know, use what they do to bring attention to to certain social causes. Uh, You know, this is not that different from something that we learned several weeks ago where uh, Sophie Goldstein and Jennifer Jordan were using the sales from their book, Darwin Carmichael is Going to Hell – and uh, at least for a while uh, before mm-hmm. you know the holidays, and or I guess during uh, right after Thanksgiving, in using those uh, profits to to donate to to causes, so that that's that's really good. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, you know not not to get get too political, but in the the kind of time we're in now, I, I'm feeling myself more and more of. Um, an obligation even to to be supporting a lot of these these different causes that are going to need support in the coming years. Exactly. And go ahead and get political. <laughs> oh. Okay. Santa's my cousin. Everybody knows he'll be here to see you. Christmas clothes, Santa, Santa, he loves you. We're going to at least momentarily leave politics behind us as we get into the meat of this week's episode, which is a discussion of the Best American Comics 2016. This is published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and for this year's volume, the guest editor is Roz Chast. Yeah, that's right. And so we just talked to Bill Cardolopoulos, mm-hmm. the uh, series editor, uh, once again about this this volume. And so now is our time to kind of go go through some of the stuff that uh, stood out to us and um, and talk about that. Yes, uh, we did have a, a great interview with Bill, and by the time this episode goes up, that interview with Cardolopoulos will have already gone up and. I don't know if you necessarily need to listen to that interview before this particular episode where Andy and I do a deeper dive into the book itself. Um, I, I think you know it could go either way, but I will say that after talking with Bill, it helped to put a number of things into context. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, for me, uh, in looking at this. And maybe maybe we can start at a, at a place – where we started in our interview with Bill, and that is his foreword. Uh, this really stood out in that, one, it's much more substantive than the general series editor's forewords are in in every year's volume. Uh, but also, it's significant because of what he specifically says and why he probably felt that he needed to to say what he said. Right, right. So he... In in this, he kind of offers us a a brief history of of comics, and uh, and as part of that, you know, outlines the idea that there there is, as he says in the first sentence, there is no mainstream in comics. Mm-hmm. Um, that basically, kind of to summarize and hope not distort it too much, that um, there are so many kind of areas of comics. Right now, uh, and comics itself is such a small um, market to begin with that um, distinguishing a, a mainstream from an alternative is not um, not necessarily, I don't know, viable or or useful at this point. Yeah, you know, they're they're useful in the sense that. For the most part, when when we use the word mainstream, I think most people know knows what that refers to. At, at least those who read comics. Um, but the meaning of the word mainstream loses its 
its power because you know the vast majority of I, I know my students when I ask them about comics, their exposure to comics and their love of comics, like nine times out of ten at least, is not going to be in the classic, let's say, comic book format. Right, right. And, you know, we, we talked about this a bit with with Bill about where, you know, our students come from who are largely like the general population, I mm-hmm. guess, uh, outside of, of comics fans. And, you know, when when you look at, for example, the Diamond sales, sales charts, um, you know, the best-selling comics – generally speaking, sell about 100,000 to 150,000 or so copies. Mm-hmm. Some some special events will sell over 200,000, uh, but that's rare. And, um, and so I don't, you know, uh, when you, when you break down those numbers, I think some, I've seen somewhere that there's, there's probably around 350,000 or so people who buy comics regularly every week. And you know that's around what point uh, one percent of the population of the United States. So um, that isn't you know that that definitely is a is already a niche uh, market. And so uh, I think that's part of what's going on here in this discussion of what makes up the uh, the mainstream. Right, uh, and I. You know, gather from our conversation with Bill and just uh, you know feeling that um, that I get from reading this that one of the reasons why he wrote this forward this time around this kind of forward is to address some issues that he may have felt has been coming up over the past couple of years since he assumed the series editor helm. Um, you know, if it's called Best American Comics, why isn't such and such in it? Or why isn't, uh, you know, something else in it? And, you know, this is something that you and I have talked about in the past. I, you know, I, I think that it's fair game to question, you know, as as readers and critics, well, why is something chosen over another? Why do we have this particular arrangement? Um, the selections that are made, it sets a particular tone. It says something about the editors themselves. Uh, and so we can discuss that. But when it comes to calling something the best, I mean, obviously that's a, a subjective call. I mean, yeah, you know, there's, there's some, you know, critical inquiry that goes into it, but, you know, one person's best is going to be someone else's as well. You know, it also doesn't take into account the fact that there are some of these things that just may be nearly impossible to reproduce. Uh, in other words, the, the right holders will not allow it or are going to charge exorbitant prices in order to reproduce it. And, and that can go in the decision of a book like this. So, um, you know, I, I've said this you know, for a number of years now, I, I love this volume, Best American Comics, this series. Uh, I just think it's unfortunate that it bears the title of the Best American Comics, but I understand why it does, because it's part of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt's Best American series. Yeah, right. And I, you know, I know when every, when we've talked about this volume in the past, too, I, I have said that none of that matters to me. Yeah, <laughs> or that that you know my my con- my interest in this volume is you know as I mentioned to Bill, kind of two two or three things. One is um, I'm interested in seeing stuff that I was unfamiliar with mm-hmm. uh, to to find you know the one or two creators that I really want to start following regularly, uh, and. You know, and another more kind of selfish reason is just to reinforce my tastes. Um, but um, you know, I, I going into this, I already know that there's there's going to be some subjectivity, and so I'm I'm really less concerned about what's not there um, than I am about um, you know what is what is there and um, what what it brings to either a volume like this or to um, my understanding of comics in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you know I'm I'm fascinated by the selections and just the process of selection. You know, mm-hmm. as much as I could conjecture in what that might mean uh, mm-hmm. in in terms of the editors 
and and also the year's offerings. Um, and you know, there's always more that we could say. Oh well, why isn't such and such in here, or why isn't this other title that I really liked in in there? But again, that that game could go on forever. Right. Um, and just just take what you have here. You know, I'm with you. I mean, yeah, it is nice to to look at this year most of the entries uh, as comics or and or creators that we have uh, discussed in the past. Sometimes specifically reviewing these texts uh, that are collected here. Um, and so that that's good because it kind of strokes my ego. It's like, oh well, we we noticed that was a good comic, and the editors did too. Um, but I think even more importantly, it's learning about new things that I didn't know about before. Although I have to say that since we've started this podcast, that experience is becoming less and less frequent. Yeah, I think I think that's an interesting point because when I when I go through this this particular volume i think that there's um there are a lot of things in here that i think you know n- number one makes sense and number two are um are things that you know we were already familiar with mm-hmm. at least and um and i'd say it, that that breaks down to about half of the book uh if not more than half um or at least half of the entries because you know we've got uh, um, Adrian Tomine is uh, killing and dying. Chris Ware's last Saturday. Drew Friedman's Our Crumb and Me. Um, Joe Sacco, uh, Linda Berry, John Porcelino, C.C. Bell, Kate Beaton, um, Richard McGuire's here. Uh, Nina Nina Bunyvac's, uh Fatherland, and um, you know various strips by Ben Catcher. And Gilbert Hernandez. I mean, I think, and there's probably others I could mention too. But those those are ones that either, um, you know, were were already on uh, top ten lists or best comics lists for uh, for a lot of critics for the time period that's being covered in this volume, or they're you know they're creators that are doing always doing consistently good work. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I can imagine every year of this volume having. Um, you know, uh, Ben Catcher strips and uh, Kate Beaton strips because th- those those two you know are, are producing really consistently good work from year to year. Yeah, and I think you can add Gilbert Hernandez in there as well because he he's coming out with stuff all the time. Yeah. In fact, one of the things I had wanted to do was to go back through the previous volumes and see which years did not include a work from one of the Hernandez brothers, but, <laughs> but I didn't have time to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, I would I would wonder too about um like Kate, you know, like Kate Beaton and Ben Catcher especially. Um it seems like, you know, they it seems like they're in almost every year, but of course that may be just me um you know, having that stuff at the top of my mind or something. Mhm. Um but you're right, the majority of these entries are either specific texts that we discussed on the show. So, for instance, Mm -hmm. the story from Killing and Dying, uh, Drew Friedman's Our Crumb and Me, and and you can go on down the list, or from creators that we have spoken with or maybe reviewed another one of their books on the show. Uh, For example, John Porcelino, which we discussed earlier this year. Um, And uh, David Lapp. Uh, David Lapp... Uh, we didn't discuss specifically this entry in the 2016 Best American Comics Mom, but I think it was Gene and I did the show uh, 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 earlier this year where we looked at Tattle Creek, which had an entry from him, and we specifically mentioned him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, so some, a lot of these creators are coming up, and um, – in our in our discussions regularly, um, and that that makes sense. Now, um, one of uh, one of the other ways too, I like to break down the contents of this is also um, to think things things that I'm familiar with, but also that I'm I'm glad are getting recognition in this that maybe don't normally get recognition or creators who don't normally get recognition who, who have been doing consistently great work um, for years. 
and um, and the one that stands out to me um, for that is um, is Keller Roberts's Powdered Milk. Mm-hmm. Um, she's been doing this autobiographical series for quite some time now, and I don't think I've seen it show up in one of these volumes. I may be wrong about that, um, but I'm, I'm really glad that's here and that's getting some recognition. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I don't remember seeing uh, Kyler Roberts' work in – any of the previous Best American Comics volumes. And in fact, I didn't discover her work until this year. Right. Um, uh, and, and I remember it was around the time that she was nominated for an Ignatz Award. And I thought that I needed to, to check it out. Well, I knew I needed to check it out because we were doing a special Ignatz nominee episode. Uh, and then I met her at SPX. And so, so there's that. <laughs> Christmas time, reindeer make it so. It's Christmas time, and children faces glow. It's Christmas, full of joy and cheer. It's Christmas, Santa Claus is near. And, and then there, there's other work as well that I'm glad to see collected here. So, for instance, uh, Anne Emmons' The Swim and Today, those two pieces. It's good to see there. Last year, I think it was – God, it, was, it, was, it wasn't more than a year and a half ago. Uh, but we did read her Debbie's Inferno yeah. for the publisher spotlight we did on Retrofed Big Planet. And so when I saw her work here, I was reminded of how much I liked Debbie's Inferno and thought, oh, OK, so it's good that uh, we have uh, these two pieces collected here. Yeah, I, I really like the one-page story today. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm going to actually use that in a class <laughs> coming up because it, not only is it, um, you know, it's a poignant <laughs> about procrastination, basically, and um, but um, I think it's a good. It can be a, a good example of um, just one of the things that comics can do, which is, you know, it's it's. Um, borderless panels. It's six images of the female character we assume is Anne. Mm -hmm. uh, That's autobiographical. Sitting on her bed and slowly curling up into a fetal position as she uh, talks about all the things she's going to accomplish and then clearly isn't going to accomplish by by the end. You know, another way of looking at each year's volume of Best American Comics is how the entries are organized. And this is something that Bill spoke with us about, that for the past two volumes, edited by Scott McCloud a couple of years ago and then Jonathan Lethem last year, they grouped the selections in certain ways according to, to theme or common topic mm-hmm. or what have you. Um Raj Chast, though, this year chose not to do something like this. And so we can't talk about the way that she groups things. And even though I liked what both McLeod and Lethem did, I equally like the fact that this year's volume is not broken down into different sections. Yeah. Um, well, the um, – I don't know. The anal retentive in me wants alphabetical order, I guess. <laughs> and so, so kind of poking around to f- try to find stuff uh, in the book um, isn't isn't too frustrating. Uh, but I'm I'm wondering um, how you see, if if at all, how you see the organizing principles playing out in this book. You know, that's interesting. I was thinking about that um, earlier today before we were recording. Um, I remember when we talked to Bill, he did mention, without going into detail or specifics, that something about the way that the stories were collected, the order, and that there was mm-hmm. some kind of reasoning there, even loosely. Mm-hmm. Um, I- I'll take him at his word. I, I really don't see that, um, but but again, I'm okay with that. What I mean is that I think that you could take these stories and mix them up in various ways, yeah. and the experience of reading this year's volume 
probably wouldn't be any different than reading them in, you know, the original order or a completely different order. Right. Um, so, I mean, I like the way that it just goes from one to the other without any link one to the, like, for instance, we don't have the, uh, Joel Ullman collection, shut your pie hole, Johnny pine top, and then immediately go into another, um, I guess what we could call for lack of a better term, you know, traditional short story in comic form, right. uh, or another Canadian creator. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's just a mix. I mean, I, I'm fine with that. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and even even at times there seem to be some concentrations of uh, autobiographical works in this. In fact, there's quite a few autobiographical works in this. That, um, but there doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, a section that's devoted to those. Um, you know, if you're gonna, you've got in kind of in the middle of the book, you do have, um, you know. Uh, Gabrielle Bell's The Dish Rack, Linda Berry's Syllabus, and John, John Porcelino's The Hospital Suite, and Leanna Fink's All the Paintings Here Agree, all of which have some you know autobiographical elements to them. And C.C. Bell's El Defo. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Sorry, I missed that one. And then, and then, um, and then you go into Kate Beaton, um, <laughs> and and then, and then you get um, you know uh, uh, Nina Bunyevic and Lance Ward later on. Um, all you know, so there isn't there, there. So again, there's a lot of autobiographical stuff in there. Not, not any of which is is kind of concentrated in one area of the book. Yeah, and you know, you could argue that Casanova Frankenstein's uh, selection, the corpse, the ghost, and the Halloweeny, is autobiographical to some degree. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, I and this is where I think not having a kind of organization comes in handy because if you're the guest editor, let's say, Ross Chast for this year. And mm. some of the comics that really stood out to you, uh, let's say a good number of them were autobiographically based in one form or another, and mm-hmm. you wanted to include all of them. If you were organizing the volume by topic or genre or theme, and you wanted a section devoted to autobiography and memoir – then you really couldn't overdo that section because it would make things look uneven, right? You may include three, let's say, tops selection from that. But if you had six or seven that you wanted to include, then, you know, you may limit yourself to three or four and -hmm. then not include the others. And so in this way, uh, by not organizing them in any kind of at least noticeable, uh, rational scheme, (laughs) then it kind of opens up to to whatever you want to include and to flow in whatever way the reader takes it. Right, right. And I, I think that that's a really good point that if a um if a section had been devoted to autobiographical comics, that might make the editor think, well, I need to limit this to maybe four instead of having the number that they have here. Plus, um I think Chast pick some some books that have um kind of borderline autobiographical qualities about them um right that uh that you know gabrielle bell's work work right. uh she admits has some fictionalization to it mm-hmm. and um um and then and then towards the end you know gilbert hernandez's um bumper heads mm-hmm. was uh Partially autobiographical, uh, takes place in the 70s, I think, late 60s, and includes a character with a cell phone or an iPad. Right. Yeah, that's one of the <laughs> things we we discussed uh, right, when we right. went to that book. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing I noticed going through this year's volume are a number of selections from books that at the time that they came out, I had every intention of reading and I even had them in a two, literally in a two read pile. Never got around to it, and eventually felt bad to where I rotated those books out of my two read pile so I could rotate others in. Um, so, so reading through this year's volume reminds me of how slack I've been in the past. But then again, I, I don't need, I think, any other reminders to, about how slack I've been in the past. <laughs> That's always on my mind. Uh, but I'm thinking of, for example, Mark Bell's. Stroppy. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I got that book and I really wanted to read it when it came out. And I even thought 
that it would be one that we could discuss on the show at one point, but I never got around to reading that. Same thing with Casanova Frankenstein selection from uh, number six issue of The Adventures of Tad Martin. Uh, in fact, I got that one, and I made a concerted effort to read the other Tad Martin books before I got to number six. But I don't think I got past issue number three, and so I didn't get to six, and then mm. again rotated that out of my to-read pa- uh, pile. But, um, you know, th- that happens. And, and it's one of the things that you and I have discussed before when it comes to our year-end show – which actually we're going to be doing for next week, uh, yeah. something for listeners to, to listen to, in that both of us may not get around to reading certain 2016 books until 2017. But by that point, we will not have been able to include them in our list of the best of 2016 because we will not have known about them at the time. Right, right, and I uh, and and I'm already well aware of a lot of <laughs> of critically acclaimed books from this year that I I never got a chance to read or never, never never sought out either. Right. Um. But um. Uh, I feel like I've got enough to talk about for a year end show anyway. Uh. But I may do a disclaimer at the beginning and let people know which ones that I probably should have read but didn't. Mm-hmm. And you know there's some there's some selections in here that are wonderful to see because they're by creators that I really enjoy but these particular pieces fell under my radar mm-hmm. and in some cases I feel ashamed about that and I think the best example of that is the selection from Chris Ware mm. that we have um this originally came out uh, in the Guardian, and I had not read this. Hmm. Had you? Yes. Okay. And see, I just did not notice that when uh, it, it came out, and so again, it uh, was outside of my awareness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know if there's um, if there's anything that 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 falls under under that category for me i mean i like um i like julia wartz's work a lot i i knew that she was doing stuff for the new yorker online and i've been i've been keeping up with that stuff here and there but not in a kind of concerted effort so i think the things that are in here vintage trash and horse bones um i hadn't read before but i have been reading i've been reading her new yorker stuff um and um I don't know if there's anything else that um, that falls under a category like that. Mm-hmm. Well, another another one for me is Liana Fink's "All the Paintings Here Agree." Um, and you know, we had Liana Fink on the show right. what almost three years ago now, it seems. And I did not know about this, and I really like this entry. I, I don't think it's anything heavy, but it's it's a lot of fun. You know, basically what we have here is as a premise. Apparently, Fink has just broken up with uh, a significant other, and this series of panels are paintings, for the most part, Mm. where Liana Fink has written in dialogue that has something to do in one way or another with getting over a boyfriend. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so these are all um, these are all in the Museum of Modern Art, mm-hmm. um, all m- most of which are famous works, right? And uh, and yeah, so one of the things I really liked about this is is that it does it does present a kind of challenge to the idea of comics in the first place. You know, each each one of these works of art is a separate is a separate work, right? And so. Uh, when you put them in sequence with um, with word balloons in them, they are they become you know different works in, in a sense, right? And and so uh, it's a challenge to the idea of what makes up uh, sequential art mm-hmm. in the in the first place. Because if you go to a museum and you walk down, you know. Um, you know, a wall and you see the different paintings in this order, do, does that order create a, a sequence 
that could be described as comics. Mm-hmm. Um, that you know, that's that you know, the images and sequence is an in- eternal debate uh, in comic studies, anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I really like what she does with these with these famous paintings and sculptures. And taking them uh, and, and making a narrative out of them. Yeah, and, and that's what it does. It does create a narrative where there was not one before. You know, I mean, there are many examples of art, let's say specifically painting, where there is a series of works that are supposed to hang together in some right. way that have narrative potential to them. Uh, you know, quite potent. Um, but here we have, you know, a series of artworks by vastly different creators. So you wouldn't think that those would be linked one to the other in terms of narrative in any way whatsoever. But what Fink does here is to do this as they're presented here in the book. And and one of the things that Bill did talk to us about in the uh, interview was the choice to lay these panels out uh, one next to the other. And again, adding to to the narrative richness here. Right, Mm. right. When you're sleeping in your bed and the bat flies round your head, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. If a full moon's in the sky and you hear a werewolf cry, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Then your stockings hanging on the mantel and the fireplace is all aglow. Santa will come right down the chimney into the fire and he will scream, ho, ho! You know, I also found it interesting in talking with Bill Cardalopoulos about the decisions of what to excerpt and how to excerpt. Uh, mm-hmm. I know I, if I remember correctly, I specifically asked him in light of McGuire's selection from here. You know, with a book like that, where do you begin and where do you end the selection? And what he explained to us makes makes a lot of sense. And I think mm-hmm. that this part of here is, is the excerpt that we have works really well. But then there are other selections that I think the the choice makes perfect sense, if not obvious, but others I don't know. And the one that to me I think it, it, it it's great what he does. I, I don't see how they could have done this any other way, how Bill or Ross Chast could have, could have done this differently, is with the Joe Sacco selection, Milk, which is from Bump Volume mm-hmm. 1. Uh, now, did you read Bump? No, I didn't. Okay. No, let, so let me ask you, how did you respond or how did you take Milk? Um, I don't know. I liked it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. It, I don't. So, uh, is there a larger context that I should be, I guess, aware of with this? Oh yes, and okay. <laughs> and so that's why I was curious what your take on this selection was. In, in other words, did you read this, and when you were done, you just scratched your head, wondering what the hell was this about? Which I think you could you could accuse this story. You know, what the hell was this about? Uh, you know, both in and out of its context. But um, I, didn't, no, I liked it. I mean, I got I got a clear sense from it that. You know this. The, this is about surveillance. That the that the caption boxes are are dialogue of pe- someone who's observing this woman as she goes to the store and buys something, and that they uh, that somehow she's kind of off the grid in terms of the the information that these surveillance people can get on her. What that uh, is lacking in relationship to everybody else. Mm-hmm. So. Um, so what what and so I thought it stood it stood alone. In fact, I didn't I didn't really th- see see it as an excerpt in the same way that like I would see um, the you know the bumper heads excerpt. But that's because I knew that that was part of a larger narrative. So, exactly. And, and so one that what's we going read. on here? Um, well, all the selections in Bump, and I and I think you can okay you can read Bump either as a more coherent manuscript or text 
that it works really well and it's closely interconnected the various pieces from beginning to end, or you can read it as a collection of individual pieces that have something to do in common, but were created at very different times. And if you go through Bump, you'll see the, the year of creation, uh, when, when Psycho was, was doing these. And so they could stand alone just as, as Milk does, but there is a larger story being told here. And the story has everything to do with contemporary politics. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely during the Obama era, but let's say over the past. Well, no, I th- I think even going back um, into the the Bush years uh, as well, the George W. Bush. Uh, so what we have going on here with this young woman going to get the milk, you will see her later in Bumpf, mm. uh, being held captive along with another individual, and uh, both of them are wearing sacks over their head. Which immediately reminds you, and it's supposed to because it's illustrated in this way, of uh, Abu Ghraib. And so there are little things like this that interlink both visually and also in terms of the story that's being told here. Um, the various comics that Sacco has included in Bump. And that, you know, I, obviously his journalistic work is very political in nature. Even when there's no, let's say, overt intention of, of politics, for instance, in in the uh, the book from several years ago on the Great War, right? Which you know more of an accordion than a book. Um, but in Bump Volume One, I think that that is the most political, uh, outright overtly political that I've ever seen or read, Joe Sacco, mm-hmm. and that comes out in in the way that he interlinks many of uh, the pieces that are collected in Bump. So uh, that's why I was interested. I, I it's been a while since I read it, but I did read it when it came out. I thought that it was great. Um. I understood what was going on with Milk and was able to appreciate it. But then again, I knew the context, and that's why I wanted to ask what your thoughts were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's interesting to know. And you know, I have wanted to read Bumpf uh, and just did, and just didn't get it when it came out. Uh, but um, I, I do, I do like what this one story says about uh, you know about surveillance and the lack of privacy that that we have in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you mentioned a a little while ago Gilbert Hernandez's bumper head, and this is something that both you and I have read, and so it's not as if we can erase our memory and then read this selection Mm -hmm. in Great American Comics 2016 and wonder if it makes sense or not. But, you know, I would think that for those who are not familiar with bumper head, that this selection from part one makes sense yeah i i think it you know it it stands on its own right just fine as much as i think almost anything from gilbert hernandez can <laughs> can do so you know i mean i think that um somebody reading this might um might wonder why it uh when in in Gilbert's statement, he says, "I wanted to show it a rough example of what being a teen in the seventies was like for me," um, and then see a an iPad in the story. Yeah, uh, but um, you know that would be confusing. That would be confu- That's confusing in the book. You know, yeah. <laughs> like it's not it's not ever explained. And when we had him on, he he said something about you know that um, he kind of threw that in there. Largely for that reason, yeah. Um, and 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 I think that you know, as far as some of Gilbert's more recent narratives that um, that can be pretty elliptical, this one is is pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I was about to say I can bet you that in a couple of years we will not see a selection from Garden of the Flesh in Best American Comics. But then again, I don't want to come back to to eat my words. That's that's true. Uh, it depends on it depends on who the editor is. Yes. Um. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think this this um, volume is is interesting to me in some surprising ways. When you know, one of which is 
that it has a lot more stuff in it, I think, than than other recent volumes that I was already familiar with, uh, or a lot more a lot more creators that I follow regularly. Um, and so there was there seemed to be less in here that was uh, revelatory to me. Uh, but you know, as I said to Bill, uh, you know, Lan- Lance Ward's uh, story that's in here, um, adults only is probably the one that stood out the most to me as something that I was not familiar with at all and would want to, um, find out more about. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I, I think there's not, not quite, I think the balance of familiarity and unfamiliarity that I'd seen in other volumes. Um, so, uh, but I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Oh Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and again, this is something that we discussed when we talked with Bill. I really enjoyed Lance Ward, that excerpt from Adults Only. Um, a couple of other finds for me, in other words, work that I didn't – and creators that I didn't know before is uh, Taylor Ruth Baldwin's piece, which is a two-pager. It's untitled, uh, and this comes from her Tumblr page. But even more so, I think, uh, in terms of how it impressed me, was Gigi's Don't Leave Me Alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, have yeah. you known of either of those creators before? I knew of Gigi um, for some reason, and I can't remember where I've seen that work before – or seen the creator's work before, but um, – I thought that yeah, I thought this story was actually it was beautiful, um, really well done. Don't leave me alone. Yeah, don't leave me alone. Yeah. So yeah, there were some. I, I was familiar with most of the creators here, but the ones that I didn't know are, you know, for the most part, I think all of them are great finds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are there any surprises in here for you? I don't know. <laughs> um, not. I, I, I tend to. I, I guess I don't know. I, I think I try to think of what would surprise me, um, and what would surprise me is maybe something I, I had read originally and hated showing up in here. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there's nothing. There's nothing. Definitely nothing like that. Um, and so the only real surprises to me, you know, like well, like Alex Schubert's Fashion Cat. Um, I am glad that's in here. I because I didn't I didn't like Blobby Boys all that much. Uh we had talked about it on the show. Uh but I did like the fashion cat part. That was probably my favorite part of that book. Mm-hmm. Um but I felt like otherwise with with the Blobby Boys there's it's a, it's a lot of that kind of offensive humor that uh that you do see a lot of and it's kind of e- I think kind of easy to do. Right. Uh but I think fashion cat there's a lot more going on with that. Yeah, you know, I, I'm with you on Blobby Boys. I thought, you know, it's okay. Um, I have no problem with the the inclusion of a part of it, the fashion cat bit. Um, and I guess the closest thing to a surprise, and I'm not really surprised. It's just something I wouldn't have thought of is Walter Scott's excerpt from Wendy, uh-huh. because I read Wendy uh, last year, and I thought, okay, and then that's it. I don't think that I gave it. Any further thought outside of the fact that it, at one point earlier this year I saw that there was going to be another Wendy book, and I thought, oh, okay, I'm reminded of Wendy and the experience of reading that last year, and then went on to forget that. So then seeing this excerpt from Wendy in this year's volume, um, again, not surprising me, it, it just – I noticed it uh, because I hadn't thought that that mm-hmm. would be a contender. Yeah. Did you read Wendy? No, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, so this was my first look at that. Yeah. But yeah, and uh, one of the reasons why I read it is last year it was nominated for an Ig Dance. Right. And I'm glad that El Defo was in here because it forced me finally to read at least a piece of it. Uh, I know that that book's been around for a while, mm-hmm. and I've, I've thought, huh, 
this looks interesting. I'd like to read it, but it's one of those – I guess because of its 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 intended audience, I just didn't go out of my way to read, um, and now I yeah. feel like I definitely should. Yeah, it is it is definitely worth reading. Um, I think that uh, CC Bell's done amazing amazing work with that book, and I'm glad it's gotten the success and notoriety and popularity that it has. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are there any standouts in this year's volume? Mm, I mean, the the Lance Ward adults only is the the big one for me in terms of exposing me to something that I hadn't seen before. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, you know, there's there's stuff that I I agree with was was good and worthy of being included in here. Like um, you know, like Killing and Dying is a story I really like, and that made you know. When that collection came out last year, that made uh, you know a significant number of top ten lists mm-hmm. uh, from critics. So um, that that's one that and um, and uh, there well there's several of these here and Nina Bunyevich's uh, Fatherland. I think among others are all ones that you know that really really deserve a place in this because those are going to be things that get read and reread and taught even in the future. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, when it comes to uh, especially Maguire's here, I mean, that just makes perfect sense to me. And in fact, if that wasn't in this year's volume, I I would have wondered why the hell not. Mm-hmm. Um, there are two entries here that really stand out to me that I, I guess I'm just really happy – that they're in. I'm happy emotionally. I'm happy intellectually. And I'm happy when it comes to my ego. Getting back to what we were talking about earlier, kind of affirms the things that we think are worth worth reading. And, and the first one is Drew Friedman's R. Crumb and Me, mm-hmm. because when we reviewed Masterful Marks, this is one of those that we specifically mention along with Peter Cooper's uh, Kurtzman piece, Mm -hmm. we said one of these two, if not both, should probably be collected in the future Best American Comics for its time, and we were right. Mm -hmm. So it it was really thrilling to see this one, and plus it's Drew Friedman's art, which I absolutely love. And then the other one that when I noticed that it was here when I first got the book, and I just felt so happy – was Joel Ullman's Shut Your Pie Hole, Johnny Pine Top. Because mm-hmm. I love that collection, Happy Stories About Well-Adjusted People. And in fact, when I read that a, a couple of years ago, uh, it was this collection that caused me to get in touch with Joe to ask him if he wanted to do an interview. And at the time, he didn't want to do one on the podcast, and so we did a text-based or email back-and-forth interview uh, which went up uh, about a year ago. Um, but but we should mention that next month we will have Joel Ullman on the podcast. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I was just really happy to see Shut Your Pie Hole, Johnny Pine Top as part of this collection. Yeah. Cause I yeah, really I'm, I'm glad that. that's here too. Yeah. And uh, I, did, I hadn't read that collection, but I really like that story. Yeah. And, and the thing I like about this story is that I think it's representative of the story writing style of Joel Oldman. Uh, he's one of the creators. And, and another one is Dakota McFadzine. Um, he does something very similar in that their stories, their short stories, are the closest thing to being crafted like a prose work of short fiction that I can think of. Um, Many times uh, with jo- with Ullman's, Ullman's work, there is no neat, easy resolution, no clear conclusion. It just kind of ends. Uh, you have an emphasis on character development. Uh, sometimes it's a quirk mm-hmm. or a quirky character. Um, but he's someone who, if he were to take his talents and put it into prose, I think would be an, an outstanding short story writer if his comics are any indication. Mm-hmm. I, I really like the, the Johnny Pine top story because I'm always, I'm always fascinated with characters who, um, you know, try to develop expertise in an obsolete 
area, especially of entertainment. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, and, you know, so a a story about a, um, about a ventriloquist, I think is really fascinating. And a ventriloquist with a cleft lip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One of the weirdest selections is the one that comes immediately after that. And this is what it's a two pager, one is by uh, Shar Esme, and then the second is by Shar Esme and Lauren Poor. Uh, Blinky Jinks Playhouse and Big Rudy's Cowgirls Club. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why I like these two pages is, well, one, they're very colorful um, and they're funny. But also it expands our understanding of comics. Right, because someone would look at this. Someone who really doesn't have much of an investment in comics, and if you were to ask them, let's say you give them the piece from Joel Oldman, and then you give them the Esme and Poor pieces, and say, okay, which one of these are comics? They're mm-hmm. going to say, oh, it's the Oldman. These aren't comics. These are posters, or these mm-hmm. are illustrations, not comics. Yeah, yeah. I, I like when they, they do this. I think they do this every year, um, have one or two pieces that kind of challenge our notion of what makes something a comic. And, you know, I think this is uh, – that's one of them and um, – or two of them, I guess, since they're two separate pieces. And um, and I think to a lesser degree but still effective is uh, Leanna Fink's. Yeah, yeah, and also I put into that grouping Guinevere Elverum's blanket portraits. Yeah, um, I mean it's definitely a comic, but it's not the comic in the way that the other selections in this book are. Yeah, did you sense anything from this year's volume of Best American Comics that you didn't previous with with previous year's volumes? Um. No, not not any more than what I um, than than what I already said. I think um, I, I'm becoming more, you know, as we do this podcast, becoming more and more familiar with the um, the kind of realms of of comics that this this volume taps into every year. So, um, you know, I I'm seeing more stuff that I'm already familiar with. That's about it. How about you? No, I I just wondered if you were noticing anything in terms of a consistency of voice with this year's volume that we may not have gotten with the previous two years. And and one of the reasons why I'm asking is it gets back to our earlier discussion topic on organization strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I didn't. I did. Nothing stood out to me along those lines. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed this year's volume of Best American Comics. What did you think about the selection of notable comics at the very end? Um, I think there, there's even fewer things I'm familiar with there. Um, I, I thought there was a lot of stuff that I didn't um, that I didn't know about that was uh, that was listed in the in the back. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't I didn't actually put a lot of thought into that. Yeah, you know, looking through this list. Um, I I I I'd have to go back to look at previous volumes notable comics list just to refresh my memory but I noticed even fewer titles and creators in this year's notable list that seemed I guess different or significantly different from the selections in here and I guess what I mean by that I mean I more or less expect not to see titles that we would call traditionally the mainstream, right? Let's say DC, Marvel, things of Mm. that sort. Although they have appeared in the notable comics list in the past. Um, But we really don't even see titles from or even creators who write for, let's say, publishers like Dark Horse, Image, Mm. and, and, and... you know, this is something that we've discussed before, and it's just a feeling that I have that I, you know, there is whether we would like for there to be or not a bifurcation between what we could very roughly call mainstream and alternative, even though you know we've problematized those terms. Um, but I think that there are things in the middle that aren't a part of either those 
extremes, even though they're not extremes, um, that tend to get overlooked. And I think that things that we've discussed in the past, um, let's say put out by Image, for for example, would be examples of those. Um, I mean, they're not part of what most people think of as comics or the mainstream, right? The superhero stuff. Um, but they're definitely not the more experimental things that you and I tend to talk about quite frequently on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Now, we do talk about a lot of of uh, Image and, and Dark Horse and IDW titles, um, but I think in collections like this, uh, the Best American Comic Series in particular, um, they tend to be overlooked, and I don't know – I'm not saying that there's an intentional overlooking. Um, I just don't know if it's on the same radar as those titles may be for other readers. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have an answer to that. Yeah. Um, that issue um i you know, um i see a handful of stuff like you know evan dork evan dorkins um eltingville club uh is in here and mm -hmm. um, scott mcleod's the sculptor and um you know uh, uh, um leslie stein's bright eyed at midnight and so on so um well, I definitely, I, I, but I think of those more on the alternative end of the scale, even though that scale is problematic. Right. Um, I, I'm thinking of more of like the stuff that that that's coming out of, I guess the the major publishers. Okay, um, you know, because there is there isn't a lot of that in the book itself, um, right? And and there does seem to be only a handful of those things in the back. Mm-hmm. And and you know I don't I don't think this year is any different from from previous years. Now every now and again we will find something in there. Like for instance, I remember seeing Saga uh, listed in the notable section, mm -hmm. and, and that makes sense. But then again, Saga I mean it's a great title, uh, but it's one of those that gets attention from people who don't normally read comics. Uh, and, but there's a lot like another image title, for example, Black Science, that people may not know about because it doesn't get as much press or as much attention. And so that might fly under the radar of, of, of certain readers who, let's say, would turn to Best American Comics and see, you know, kindred spirits. Yep. Um, but it's always a joy to look through and read each year's volume of the Best American Comics. Yeah. So any final thoughts on this year's volume? No, I mean I think I think much like, you know, my response to it is is pretty similar to my responses that have I've had to to, to previous volumes. Um glad to see things that um I was familiar with and expected to be in here and also glad to see things that were new to me. Yeah. Uh and again, it was great to have Bill on the show, and we hope that we can make this an annual event, even though we didn't do it last year, because it does help to put things into a little different context than just reading it on our own. Yep. And if you want to experience great comics like the ones collected in this year's volume of The Best American Comics, then you would do well to visit the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to DCBService.com, and there you will find a ton of comics. Mainstream, alternative, or whatever the hell you choose to call them, it doesn't matter. It's comics. They have great discounts. That's all you need to know. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. 
That's right. Or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or you can get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And we also have our Twitter feed. You can check it out at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us and let us know how we're doing. That's right. And we do like to hear from you. Now, as we do every year, the penultimate show is our look at that year's Best American Comics volume. But the last show of the year, which will be going up next Wednesday, is my and Andy's favorite comics of the past year. Yeah, that's right. And I'm looking forward to that show. Yeah, I am too. And one of the things that is distinctive about this is that you and I do not share our choices with each other before we start recording. Yeah. So it's an experience and even a surprise all the way around. Right. Yeah. So look forward to that. And until next week, have a great holiday. I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya. I feel so, so mistletoe Just don't know where this will go Ding-a-ling, 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 ding-a-la Ding-a-ling, ding-a-la When I close my eyes and really try I can almost see the snowflakes fly Ding-a-ling, 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 ding-a-la So, so mistletoe Just don't know where the soul go Ding-a-ling, 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 ding-a-la Ding-a-ling, ding-a-la When I close my eyes and really try I can almost see the snowflakes fly Ding-a-ling, 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 ding-a-la Ding-a-ling, 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 ding-a-ling Ding-a-ling, 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 ding-